will say it is a pleasure to speak with you. It is an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the time. A 88 is a very special film. Um, oh, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Well, it, it truly is. I was wondering what it, now I know you directed, you also wrote, is that correct? Yeah, uh, well, I did too many jobs and it's embarrassing to say how many jobs I did on the film because it sounds, it makes me, it makes me appear very, uh, you know, egotistical, but uh, it was through, it was through necessity to keep the budget low. So that was the reason because a lot of the jobs I did, I hate doing and I would rather never do again, but I wrote, directed, produced, edited. I was one of the producers. So we had a lot of other producers as well. Edited, um, wow. did post-production, did voice work, did some VFX. Yeah. So it was a, a few too many things, but uh, most of those things I do not enjoy. That's you know, I, I don't enjoy, but uh, yes, yes, that was, uh, that was the case. Um, and it's a movie that took a really long time to make. Like I wrote it, the original short film in like 2015. Um, after, yeah, I had a very successful short film at Tribeca in 2015. And that was like more of a, it was based on, what's it called? It's called Strangers on a Train, if you saw the Hitchcock film. So that was the inspiration for the setup of that movie. And it was about drones, military drones. And after that, um, I had a decision that, am I going to make something similar or try and do something a bit different? And there was an incident that happened, and I wrote about this. It was actually the Tamir Rice uh, murder in 2014 that set the seed for how ATA came to be. Because that happened, and it made me look at race differently. I was like, oh, this can't be just good and bad people. Because a lot of the people's reaction to that murder and the way they were reacting, and when I looked at the, their, their sort of personality and lives, I just realized that it was more complicated. So that was really the genesis of everything. But yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, roles and a long journey. Yeah, actually, I'm really glad you said that because so much of this film is sort of, it, this is not a film that has straight up villains, although there's straight up evil. You know, it's, it's a very interesting blurred line between the two. Uh, I was wondering as you're creating it, why was that important for you to? to bring into the story. because of what I learned I, I I don't believe there is I don't believe in race first of all like I don't I think that there's a human race and that's it I think you know obviously the creation of black white Asian and all these things our, our power structures you know which is what sort of stems out of white supremacy and so on so it was very important for me to make a movie that if anybody is truly honest when they watch it and they're not triggered by just the conversation and they actually pay attention to what I'm saying they'll realize that, no, this movie is, we're all victims of this matrix thing. And the only way that we're going to get out of it is to start looking at it from an abstract perspective, but directly having the conversation. So for example, there are commentators who have an issue with the fact that I'm very blunt in the movie and they say, oh, it's not subtle enough. It's too on the nose. It's too, and I, I actually say that, you know what? Subtlety and so on is actually based on the responders, based on the person who's actually receiving the information. So for example, for some people watching Top Gun Maverick, that is on the nose. For watching American Sniper, that is on the nose. But for other people, this is the most nuanced, patriotic film that they've ever seen in their lives. From my world, the perspective that I lived through or the lens I lived through as a Black guy who's been Black my whole life, apparently, these issues mean a lot. And in some cases, it's life and death. So for somebody to tell me that I have to be subtle when I have the conversation is ludicrous, especially when they're not from that experience. So for me with the movie, it was very important that, look, I'm going to be very direct. I'm going to just say things. But what's important is that once I put this stuff on front street, the way I'm going to come at the conversation, if you're open-minded enough, you will realize that there are no villains in the movie. It's just characters with perspectives. So whatever position you're in, whether you're on the right or the left or a centrist, you will find something in this conversation that makes sense to you. So that was why I did it that way. And I'm glad you said that because some people do not take the film that way and they view it as a, as a woke movie, which is weird. But uh, that was not the intention at all. Um, it was definitely to make something that doesn't have your typical black and white villains, pun intended. Yeah, th there's... 
there every scene it feels like it has some sort of conversation going on to challenge sort of ideas um and one of the things that I, I that i loved one of the comments that i thought was so interesting and you you talked about uh, the film uh film's perspective a bit it talks about how it extend talk about the comment is extending to the soul of a country and i thought that was a fascinating comment because we're, there's so much in here that talks about deeply rooted issues it's not one person one scenario but we're getting really underneath this in in so many ways and and my question i guess is if we're talking about racial issues extending to the soul of a country what if anything can be done to redeem that soul of the system it starts with acknowledgement and the conversation and the willingness to actually have the conversation you see the reason why we're still in the position that we're in now is that we have the conversation the same way because the conversation that's been had the way it's been had is comfortable for the demographic that's in power it's a comfortable thing they set up the way you talk about race they set up the way you talk about economics and as long as you talk about these things in siloed specific bite-sized sections and everybody's happy what i think is important and the reason why i actually made the movie this way is that i was like you know what based on the way that I see this I can't speak about one thing without talking about the six other things connected to this mm. like it's just impossible because that is my daily lived experience I walk out I wake up in the morning I'm, I'm seeing I'm watching TV I have to process the news and the films or whatever I'm seeing then I go to the office I have to switch and then process my interactions with the people then I come back to my family I have to switch and I, these are all things that are connected now, if I'm now talking to demographics that are not in mine, I felt that, look, the soul of the country is corrupted and it's corrupted because of how the genesis of America, basically, the genesis of the British Empire, for example, and so forth. If you don't go to the root of it and go all the way back, which is why there's so many history lessons, quote unquote, in the movie, if you don't trace this all the way back to the genesis, there is no way you're not going to repeat the same mistakes. And there's definitely no hope of you resolving anything. But because there's such an unwillingness to grapple with history and look at how history has informed where we are today, and the fact that the mainstream media and the films and the movie business and so forth are complicit in this, like they're complicit in this propagation of the status quo, you don't have any hope. There should be a hundred movies like this. And if there were a hundred movies like this, we wouldn't be in this, in this situation because they would have more resources to have the conversation. I made this movie on a shoestring, you know, so I didn't have the resources necessary to do what I really wanted to do. Mm. But if you have the resource and people can actually engage with these things the way they need to be engaged with, it's even more than hope. I don't even think hope is the right word. I guarantee it would be resolved because there's goodness in all of us there's goodness in so many people and it was really important for me to make the movie this way because i don't believe when i see a white person that oh they're inherently racist mm. somebody from the white community is cannot understand what i don't believe that i think it's just if you're in an environment that has not allowed you to cultivate the ability to have the conversation you need to be willing to cultivate the ability to have the conversation because 88 is not a complicated movie to a lot of black people but to people who are white who might watch it, it is going to be complicated because my question would always be, when was the last time of your own volition you were at a breakfast table or in a bar and you just decided to have a conversation about white supremacy? Just of your own, for us, we do it all the time. Yeah, It's like a regular thing. It's like it's a throwaway conversation. You just have the conversation. So what that does is that it, it creates, a, it's almost like running on track or training or going to the gym you build the muscle of being able to tolerate and deal with the conversation. So that's the answer I would give you. I was like, no, you just have to have a lot of these types of films that put that, that train people to have this conversation. And then it'll be a lot easier for us to resolve some of these issues. I know that was very convoluted, but hopefully that makes sense. No, it made, to it made total sense. And actually, I love that comment there. Because, you know, as, as a white male myself, I like the idea of training because I'll be honest, I don't always know how to have this conversation and to be just sitting at a bar and say, Hey, let's talk about white supremacy. Right. 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 I, I, I want to do it the right way. Um, that is a complex, say we talk about complexity. I, I want to make sure that I'm doing it in a loving and honest and open way. 
Right. Um, from from my I, myself. Yeah, no, I hear you. And I think what I also want to remove is the feeling of guilt that white people have in having the conversation. You know, that feeling of, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to be insensitive. I don't want to. And I'm like, you know what? That's part of the problem because you're so unused to dealing with this stuff that you, like you're saying, you don't know how to begin the conversation. You see, for me, I can be in a bar and just switch into talking about it and then switch back to talking about the basketball game on the TV or the football game. It's that easy because I'm so well versed in that conversation and I think that is the real big disconnect. And actually, that is actually the biggest um, challenge for a movie like this is pushing through that and getting the movie to an audience that would actually be willing to absorb what the movie is. Because I was actually heavily influenced by Oliver Stone. By the, I mean, you, you, that's probably ov obvious to you. Yeah. Like JFK was a massive influence for the film because Oliver Stone put a quote at the end of his film where he said it's for the youth and he was handing over the, the duty of to carrying on the fight for truth to the youth. And when I saw that, I was 11. Yeah. And that stuck in my head. I never thought I was going to be a director or a filmmaker or anything. So when I was making this movie, I watched the movie again and again. And I remember that quote. And I said, I'm really glad I made this film because I know I'm going to get hammered for this. But he was always a fearless filmmaker who didn't really care about that and always pushed for this is what I believe this is what I want to talk about and this is how I want to talk about it and he just did it I didn't have the resources he had to do what he did but I'm really glad I was able to do something that was partially inspired by his work I don't know if I'll ever meet him I've never met him before but hopefully one day he'll see the movie um but that was actually a really big thing for me like I think as filmmakers and artists it's really important to be willing to to challenge yourself and to do things that might on the surface be difficult you know in terms of just having those conversations but having conviction in your point of view and just putting it out there you know you know it's interesting you talk about that quote from oliver stone one of the things i noted in this film is how often we we see through the eyes of the sun and I thought that was really fascinating. Uh, you know, the, the the moment when the police officer arrives and he just, the camera just sort of lingers on on the badge and the gun or the scene where, where his father is coaching him on what to do if a police officer comes. Um, maybe you've already answered it, but I, was, I was wanted to know why that was so important to, to take that approach to the filmmaking in those moments. Because I, I believe that that's when everything gets formed. And I was looking at the impact of this massive thing that is even too big for most adults to deal with and the effects that all these massive machinations have on a little kid who has no idea about anything. Like he's still forming his opinions. He's still forming his opinions about himself, his place in the world and where he's going. And I was showing how these, these massive things actually do have an impact through the perspective of a child in how they see so the kid doesn't know why he's reacting to the badge and the gun the way he is necessarily he's still trying to figure out that okay i'm afraid of this is it am i afraid of it because of all the videos i've seen on youtube or should i really be afraid? this is my uncle as well he's my uncle so i shouldn't be afraid of him. blah 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 and i was just basically saying that look it's more interesting to see this through his eyes and not explain anything mm. as opposed to an adult who would then give a perspective on what they're seeing because i don't think that anybody can argue the kid looking at it that's what a kid that's how a kid would react so even if you watch the film you're not going to be like ah you know i i hate the fact that the kid was reacting i'm like it's a child how what is he supposed to and i like having conversations about these things that way because i think that like you said about the soul going to the soul you need to go to white asian black all these children and say all right how do you view the world and how do you view each other? And at what point in your growth did things change and why? That's the way I view it. It's like at some point in a white kid's time on this planet, things changed. In the beginning, they're not born racist. They're not born prejudiced. They're not born with any of these things. Somewhere, something changed and it came from external stimuli. What role do we have in providing this external stimuli in shaping the minds of the young children? Which is why what the mother did is so important in saying, go on this ride along with your uncle, his uncle taking him on this thing, 
to start to make an effort to deconstruct whatever is happening in his head, regardless of the fact that she feels a type of way about her brother-in-law. So I think that was why I wanted to do it from that perspective, because I think it is, it's a purer angle to look at anything from, is if you say, okay, look, we know what's going on, but how would a kid see this? And how would a kid respond? Well, you know, and, and, you know, we're running out of time, but maybe this is a good way to, to wrap this up with the last question here, because I love that you're, this is what you're saying um, about, you know, something happens from external, uh, external circumstances. But one of the other things I think it, it, Femi, is, is it Femi, the main character? Yes, yes. Um, when he goes to uh, the former Nazi's home, and he's able to come in, it's because he asks the right questions. So just as we're wrapping up here, I guess my my final question is, what does it mean to ask the right questions to you? I think that you answered it already indirectly, is once your mind is open enough and you're looking at things differently, the right kind of questions would come from, it's not who is doing it, it's why. So once you start thinking of the whys and what motivates people's actions, you get closer to the truth. Mm. What we're focused on in America, what we're focused on in the UK, what we're focused on in geopolitics and in general is just who. He's the villain, he's the villain, he's the villain, he's the villain. This person is doing this because he's on that side of the fence, on that side of the fence. If you take a step back and you say, okay, look, what actually motivates people? And why? Why are you making this decision? Why power? How do you gain power? Money. How do you gain money? Politics, putting people in the right positions. How do you get people in the right positions? You start asking the right kind of questions. Things like COVID start making sense. Things like the war in Ukraine start making sense. Things like African poverty start making sense. All these seemingly massively complicated things that are going on in the world start making a lot more sense when you start saying that, you know what? The right kind of questions is the why and not who. And when you start thinking about the why, you see that we're actually more connected than separate, regardless of the skin color. You just start asking why, you're like, oh, wait, hang on a second. A guy who is at the same economic level as me is my brother. Like, that is not a different person. Like, we're actually fighting the same fights. And the idea of us being separated is coming from the top, not at this level or below. So I think with the Hans character, Hans was somebody who, obviously, I didn't have the time or the resources to expand on it. But the idea with him is that he understands what's really going on. And that opened his eyes to his own sins, but also the fact that if I can just impart this information to Black people, they will begin to focus on this differently. It's not about fighting. It's about thinking. Yeah. That's the point. It's like all the marching and the protest. It's, it's not about that. It's ideas. Yeah. It's about thinking. So if you can put that in the minds of the community and you say, okay, look, guys, it's not about fighting differently. It's about thinking differently. That's half the battle. And that goes for whites, community, black community, Asian, Latin, and so forth. So that's really where I was get what I was getting at with that. I didn't obviously say what the questions were, but it's that he started pushing, hey, I'm not coming to interview some Nazi, ex-Nazi guy to get something salacious or say, no, I'm actually saying that you might have the answers to what these people are actually looking for. And why? I really appreciate that. And I appreciate this conversation. And I hope this conversation helps start other conversations as well. And I really uh, think the film is wonderful. And thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. And if you see Oliver Stone ever, tell him I said hi. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll let him know. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.